Our portion of scripture that we're going to be reading from is going to be found in Romans chapter 7. If you can turn in your Bibles, I don't know what it is in the Pew Bible, but uh, I'm failing here. That, that's uh, something that Sinclair Ferguson does all the time, and Phil has picked up that habit, which is good. But uh, Romans chapter 7, and um, we're going to look at the first seven verses of in Romans chapter 7. Excuse me, the first 13 verses in Romans chapter 7. And um, I'm going to uh, try to, to uh, hopefully uh, expound on that just a little bit or to teach on that just a little bit so that it will maybe help us uh, as, we, as we approach this sometimes confusing and difficult passage of Scripture. So hear the word of the Lord in chapter 7, um, verse 1. It says, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Thus a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he, while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, She will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God." For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had Yet, if it had been, had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would have not have known what it is, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become Sinful beyond measure. Here in reading, here in ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray, Father. We thank you for this word. I pray, Father, that um, you would uh, give me clarity as I seek to teach it, and uh, that it would be helpful. Um, we pray this now in Christ's name. Amen. Um, I have uh, obviously chosen a very difficult subject, and that is the book of Romans. But I, I have felt that. Romans, um, if, if it's something that I can try to get across some of the teaching, it's very helpful. I'm, I'm basically um, going through the book of Romans, having listened to Martin Lloyd-Jones, having listened to Sinclair Ferguson and read on uh, James Montgomery Boyce, and, and, and trying to take this to the men out at uh, Broken Lives in an effort to give them just real assurance and an effort to to explain to them what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be justified. And so that's kind of this is where I am in, in teaching them now in Romans chapter seven. And that's why uh, it, it kind of works out for me to maybe try to use you guys as guinea pigs, I guess, in a way. But uh, or them. I don't know who somebody somebody's a guinea pig there. But um these these chapters, chapter six and chapter seven, um, are are uh, kind of seen as a parenthesis between chapter five and chapter eight. 
you know, just, just a quick review of, of the book of Romans. Um, Paul is, is writing that letter because he wants to encourage the people in, at the church of Rome. He wants, he, and he wants to be mutually encouraged by them as well. And he hopes to be with him. He's never, never actually formally been at the church uh, in Rome. But he wants to, as he is getting ready to travel to, his idea is to travel to Spain on a missionary journey. I don't think he ever makes it. But his idea is to meet with them at that time. And so he wants to mutually encourage them. And he wants to encourage them primarily about this gospel. He calls it sometimes his gospel. And, you know, the, the, uh, the verses that were kind of the, the theme of the book is, is that that's found in 1, 16 and 17. It says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in, in the gospel, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And so that's, that's kind of what he's, he's seeking to do is to, is to tell them how they can have the righteousness of God because he spends the next two chapters, two and a half chapters in, in the rest of chapter one, chapter two, halfway through chapter three, just showing them that they're, they're hopeless. Whether they're Jew or Gentile, that, that every person stands condemned by the law of God. And, and that there is no, uh, that there is no life to be found in seeking to keep that law because no man can keep the law of God. And so he explains to them and then he gets to that, that critical verse in chapter three, verse 21, 20, let's see, it changes at 20 and 21 when he says this. He says, um, But now, after, after, you know, we, we read the first, those first two verses. I didn't do the whole thing. It says, verses 11 and 12, he just sums it all up. And he says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands or seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And after he finishes up, after several ver- ver- more verses there, then he gets to verse 21 and says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. So he again, Paul is is wanting them to know that this righteousness that's required by God is not going to be found by keeping the law. Rather, it's going to be found as they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that it's only by faith through grace that they can be saved, that one can have eternal life. And so he goes, chapter 4, chapter 5, bringing up the, um, uh, bringing up the importance of, of, um, of understanding just exactly what's happening in their lives. Um, and, and what Paul does throughout so much of this is he, he, uh, he anticipates questions. He is really well suited to do that because Paul is a Pharisee. He struggled with all these things himself. Um, and, and he's lived what he's telling us now. He's basically lived in his life. And some of these questions that, that he's asked of others and himself had to, had to question about the, the difficulty of, well, what about the law? Are you, you know, what do you mean I can't be saved by the law? That's, the law is so important. And, and are you not doing away with the, uh, uh, what, you know, and, and they, they bring up, he, he anticipates a question about Abraham. So he answers questions about Abraham, that Abraham was saved by faith. Show that in Genesis chapter uh, 15, verse 6. And also, he, uh, he, he discusses the holy idea about circumcision and says that Abraham was not saved through circumcision. He was saved through faith. And that's what it, it testifies in that. So he's, he's doing that. And then he gets all the way to chapter five and, and, um, in, in talking about how we've, lo- we've been lost. The, the problem is we're in Adam, that there, there are two people. There's either those who are in Adam or those who are in Christ, the second Adam. And so he's pointing out the fact that, um, being in Adam is, is not good in the sense that sin has caused all of these problems in our lives. But now, the second Adam has come along, and his righteousness covers all of those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's where he, 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 so that's where Sinclair Ferguson says that actually 
You could just end at chapter 5 and go right on to chapter 8. Steve read the first four verses in chapter 8. Now, therefore, there's no condemnation. But in chapters uh, 6 and 7, he knows that there's going to be so many questions. And, and what, what prompts those, what actually prompts the, um, uh, the, him having to go back and discuss sin and how we're dead to sin and the law and how we're dead to the law, what causes him to do that is found in verse 20. It says, now the, this, this is what he, how he, he kind of finishes up, uh, it's verse 20, there's, tw- it, it, there's actually verse 21, but verse 20 says this, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that Paul's having to answer and that what he anticipates are these questions about sin. Because, you know, in chapter 6, he turns right around and he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, by no means. King James says, God forbid that should ever happen. Um, the idea is not that, that, uh, that there's anything that, that, that it's okay just to go on sinning. Paul has been accused of, probably repeatedly, of being an antinomian, being someone who is against the law. And, and he is not going to, um, and, and he's not going to give any, any uh, quarter in that because that's the very opposite reason that God has, has come into the, to, uh, has given us life is so that we wouldn't sin. And we will see that in, in this passage today. So, so chapter six, then he spends chapter six refuting the idea that grace encourages sin. In fact, as we know here, you know, as, as we know because we believe so strongly in the doctrines of grace, that, that grace is actually to encourage holiness in our lives. Um, and then in chapter 7, which what, what we read was a text this morning, says chapter 7 refutes the idea that grace does away with the law. So, so um, uh, the, 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 uh, the grace does not do away with sin, um, I mean, that, that sin is, that, so the, the, the purpose there is, is that it doesn't encourage sin, grace does not encourage sin, and it does not cause lawlessness. And that's, that's one of the things he wants to point out. So uh, he, he articulates all these things, um, he answer, and he seeks to try to answer, answer each one of their objections that he anticipates, or ones that he's had himself, so that he can, uh, he can, answer the, the, the questions that they're going to have after he mentioned that in 520. Um, so in verses 1 through 6, uh, they, they break this, this chapter down in like three sections, verses 1 through 6, verses 7 through 13, and verses 14 through the end of the chapter. And that's that part we won't get into, and I don't know how much we'll get into all of this other but uh, I, I do want to try to carry that, just kind of mention what he's saying in verses 1 through 6 is seen as um, the fact that we have this new rela- relationship with Christ. He uses this illustration, which seems kind of like a, an odd one, but um, as one of, the, one of the guys, either Sinclair Ferguson or I think Martin Lloyd-Jones points out, is that, is that Paul, oftentimes when he sought to defend himself or do apologetics or speak into issues, he would always find common ground. And so he found something they could understand. And that was that if a woman is married to a man, by law, she is obligated to, be, to remain married to that man. He said, we all can agree with that. And, uh, and so then he, um, he says, and as long as he remains alive, she would be considered an adulteress if she was to live with another man. And then he kind of switches gears and he gets into chapter, he gets into verse four and he says this in verse four. He says, um, uh, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Well, it's interesting because you would think, okay, he's died. The husband has died. Well, then you mean the law has died? No, 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 no. He doesn't say that. He says, you have died to the law. So he kind of switches the, the metaphor around or he sw- switches. He kind of makes a little 
interesting twist in this illustration, but what he's doing is he's showing this, this vital relationship that we have now being united to Christ. Now we are married to him. And you know, he's, he's made these, he's made these illustrations or he's used this whole idea about union with Christ and how important that is. And, and he said, you know, we were united in Adam. We're no longer united in Adam. We're in Christ now. And that union is just of, of utmost importance. And so he says in there in, in verse four that, um, uh, this new relationship is, is with Christ. We have this new union with Christ and thus we have died with the law and, uh, and died to the law. And he brings up, I mean, interestingly enough, he brings up the gospel in this and that he says, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. He's going to emphasize the importance of, of the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Um, and, and why? Well, it's in order that we may bear fruit for God. Again, he's dismissing this whole idea that we are to be lawless or that somehow grace leads to sin or grace leads to lawlessness. He's saying, no, the whole reason that Jesus has done this is so that we might live holy lives. Um, so, uh, and then, and then verse Verses 5 and 6 are almost one statement. It gives a negative and a positive. What he says here, he says, For while living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Um, that, that shows kind of the negative aspect of it. And these, these, uh, the, the, the flesh is, is kind of a key word he's going to use throughout the rest of chapter 7. And, um, uh, and, and that is that when Paul mentions the flesh, what he's speaking about there is, is the sinful part of man. That, that, what he's talking about are these sinful passions, our affections and lusts that arise from natural appetites that we have, but which become and have become disordered and controlling due to the fall. I, I think of, of Titus 3, um, 3 through 8. It says, for we ourselves... No, 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 that's something else. Um, uh, let me just turn there. Um, this is what he says in, in Titus. He mentions uh, Titus 3 says this. Be any, I don't know why I can't. That's one I'm supposed to have memorized. Titus 3, 3 through 8 says this. It says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. This basically points to the fact that in the flesh, um, that, that is our sinful passions. And it describes us before we were believers. The flesh is, is, is how Paul refers to us. And that there are really only two types of people, that, and that there's only two types of, of or two standings, and that is either you are in the flesh or you, in the, you're, you are in the spirit. Um, you may remember uh, not too many years ago, there was this whole idea of the carnal Christian, which is really in itself an oxymoron. There is only either a person who is fleshly and carnal, who is lost and still not in Christ, or there is the person who is spiritual, um, and and so uh, and and that is the person who is who is in Christ, who has received Christ. So um, the, the the flesh is something he's going to refer to uh, at different times through the uh, through this um, through this uh, chapter in chapter seven, and and he'll continue on. Again, bringing out here in verse six, it says this, but now we are released from the law, having died to what was, to what has held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, not under the law, but in the new life of the spirit. So we who were once fleshly now live according to the spirit. And that's one of the things he's, he's bringing up in here. Um, uh, so they, th these verses show us the terrible nature of sin. And, and also the limited value of teaching, uh, of, of moral teaching, um, the true purpose of the law and our absolute need for Christ. Um, one of the things that, that was pointed out and has been pointed out, and I think it's evident to us, is that 
moral teaching, apart from the gospel, accomplishes nothing. You know, there's always this big push to put the Ten Commandments in school. There's always this, this, this idea that we need to, to give, we need to, we need to make new laws. I mean, we are one law-filled country. I mean, we make laws, we make laws, and, and, uh, but without giving people the gospel, they have no power to change. Um, and that's why we've probably seen this, if we look back in our own lives, we, you know, we live in kind of a legalistic kind of environment. Of, you know, we see, we have, there's a lot of fundamentalism. Maybe many of us came out of fundamentalist faith. And what's interesting about that is, even though we may preach in that fundamentalist vein about don't go to movies, don't do this, don't do that, divorce is rampant, sexual immorality is rampant, um, we teach sex education in our schools and the kids have more sex than they've ever had, giving people the moral law without giving them Christ, the gospel, is actually a, a negative effect. It's just got a very limited effect at being able to do that. All we're doing is just, and, and we're going to see the reason that is. He's going to point out what that, what that, why that is. Um, he, he, so, so Paul, after talking about this and talking about the law that we're no longer under the law, that, uh, he, he now anticipates the next objection, and that is in, in verse seven, he says this, it says, uh, well, what shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. Uh, he says, but if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would have not have known what it is to covet if the law had not been said. You shall not covet. I'm trying to think who the, I think it was um, John Newton said that probably you can trace most problems, most problems in the Christian church to the fact that there is not a clear understanding of the purpose of the law. Why do we? Why is the law uh, given to us? And Paul's going to point out that the law was never meant to save. It was always just to point out sin in our lives and to expose it, much like an x-ray would or, or some kind of imaging that they might do. That's what the law does, is the law points out to us our sin. And so the law is good in that sense. Um, but it shows the, the nature of sin, and, uh, and it, it also vindicates through these next five or six verses, 7 through 12 or 13, what Paul does is he vindicates the law while showing that the real culprit in all of this is sin and how sin is used in the Christian's life and in the unbeliever's life as a fulcrum, almost as a way to wedge. And to, I mean, the, the idea there being that... Um, I like what uh, Sinclair Ferguson's example of this was where uh, growing up in Scotland, they had parks oftentimes, pretty parks, and they had people who watched the parks to keep you off of the grass, and, and they were called parkies. And um, he, uh, he said, you know, what was the first thing the kids did? They ran out on the grass. I mean, anytime we get the law, we notice that what it does is it stirs up within us kind of this desire to just buck up and to rebel against it. We don't, we don't, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want, you know, so, so the nature of the law is to, is to use these things, is to use, uh, is, is that sin will use the law as a way to, to really, um, cause even more problems, you know, to cause even greater rebellion. Um, so just as one cannot be justified by the law, neither can one be sanctified by the law. Our only hope is in Christ. It, it's not as if I can, I can just take the law and just follow it perfectly um, because I never will be able to because the, the, the sin, the remnant of sin that remains in my life um, is, is going to constantly work as, as something that should cause me to, to look at that and to, and to go to Christ. To, to look to Christ as my only hope and something like that. So we see that it, 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 it works as a, as, as a, uh, as a, as a fulcrum or a way to kind of, I think one of the, one of the terms that's used in here is the law is used in our hearts as kind of a beachhead, as kind of a, as kind of a place where you set up an outpost and then, and then sin comes and begins to just Look at it and and uh, and and find ways, either around it or or to to 
to serve apart from Christ, apart from the gospel, if we're not living by the Spirit. Um, so look at, look at verse 9, what it says here in, in verse 8 and 9. So it says, um, after, after he gets done in verse 7 in, in saying, is a problem with the law, he says, no, the problem was with sin. And verse 8 says, but the sin, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The way that, the way that this is explained is that... Um, is that sin and, and the law has always been there, and that the law, so, so sin lies dead. Well, what it is is until the law comes along, it doesn't really stir anything up in, the, in, the person's, uh, in, in a person's life. That once, once we are, um, and, and, and the illustrations that are given uh, in, in Scripture would be the, the rich young ruler. If you remember the rich young ruler when he goes to Christ, he says, "Good teacher, good, good." You know, he said, "What must I do to be saved?" First thing he says is, "Why do you call me good?" You know, only God is good. He says, "Well, you've heard the commandments," and he lists off four or five commandments: "Don't steal, don't cheat, don't you know, don't commit adultery." I, I'm not sure what those are because it's in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. And um, he said, "Well, all those things I've done." You know, he's he's self satisfied. He feels good about himself because he's really kind of dead to the law. He hadn't seen it. And then what does Jesus say to him? He say, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And he walked away depressed, disappointed. He was not moved by the, he, he was not moved to a point of actually changing. He walked away and resisted. The illustration of Paul would probably, and this is this is where Sinclair Ferguson speculates a little bit, but I think he's probably right about this. I mean, it sounds like it makes sense to me. Who am I to argue with him? But he says this about about um, um, about Paul that Paul's using himself here as an example, and he's saying, until the law came, I wasn't aware of it. Until it's not to lust or not to covet, I didn't know. And he says, and, and he says, and then when it did, it, it killed me. <clears throat> the illustration that, that or, or what Ferguson points out is that more than likely, Stephen really got under Paul, really got Paul good. It was through Stephen. Remember, Paul, if, you, if we looked at Philippians, we would see a passage of Scripture where, where, you know, he said, if anybody according to the law or a Jew, I'm a Jew of Jews. You know, he, he excelled. He wanted to be the man, the go-to man. I mean, you can remember he was he was schooled by who was it? Um, who? Gamaliel. Yeah, Gamaliel. Yeah, he was schooled by Gamaliel. He was in the particular. He was he was um, uh, just a Jew of Jews. He kept all the laws. He he was self-satisfied. He was he just thought he had it going on, but the law had not really hit him. And then if we looked at, at Acts, I'm just going to turn over there for just a minute. In Acts chapter 6, listen what, what it says in here about, about Stephen. Uh, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, freedmen in a synagogue, uh, and of the Syrians... And of all the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia. Well, that's where Paul was from, Cilicia. He was Saul at the I mean he was yeah, he was Saul at the time. And they rose up and they disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Um and then they secretly instigated men. Um I think I think it's Ferguson who said, you know, the Pharisees were not by nature people who were out persecuting the church. Nicodemus wasn't persecuting the church. Most of the Pharisees weren't. Even even Ananias kind of gave him a passing, you know, he, he, he didn't. But it was Paul. Well, what was it about Paul? What was he re- responding to? Sinclair would say that it was, it was his debates that he was having with Stephen. And he could not... 
He couldn't overcome him. You know, he couldn't, he could not over, you know, as it said here, uh, it said that he was mighty in spirit. They could not withstand the wisdom he had. He knew the word of God. And as you can tell by the, 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 uh, sermon that he gave, you know, not too long after that, just prior to him being stoned. And so as a result, he says there was something stirred up within Paul. There was a lust. No longer was he number one. <laughs> I love this illustration that Sinclair Ferguson gave. He said, teaching a seminary course one time, he had students come up to him, and he picked up on this in some of the students in that one of them came up to him one time and said, so this paper, he said, I didn't get an A. Sinclair said, well, let me see it. And he looked at it, and he said, no, you're right. It's a B, B plus. He said, but it's not an A. He said, let me look at it again. Well, that's because I gave you a B plus. And he said, you don't understand. I always get A's. And he said, well, you've got a B plus now. <laughs> he just was, the, the, anyway, it was just really interesting. He said he, he kind of picked up on a bit of impertinence. But it was the fact that this person never had been challenged in that one area that, that, that he realized that he just was very self-satisfied and very smug. He used that as an example. But in Paul's case here again, we see that, um, that, that something about the fact that, that Stephen withstood him and they couldn't withstand his wisdom really bothered him and caused him to react. And I think, I think back about, you know, Jeremy's been giving us different, different, um, Play by plays of what goes on at the abortion clinics. But have you ever seen people act so intense about something that's so questionable a practice? I mean, even if you, even if you think, okay, I have a right, I have this freedom, whatever else, you still can't deny the fact that there is a child at some stage of development there that you're killing that person and they can't get over it and they don't want to be challenged by that. And that's what you know, so, so in some cases, we hope those people, they themselves will come to an understanding that Jesus Christ is the only way, that, that they'll, they'll be confronted by the law, which they, they never have, um, in a way that, that really will cause them to respond in a right way. So that's, that's the purpose of, of the law, is to expose sin and to point us to Christ. And that was always, the, the, whole, the whole point, I think, that's being made of what Paul's doesn't come out and say verbatim, but he, what he's pointing out to him is that the Jews have missed the whole purpose of the law. That even with the Mosaic system, whether it was a ceremonial law, all of those things were to cause him. I heard somebody say one time that if a father went to sacrifice a lamb or a cow or whatever he was sacrificing, whatever they were able to afford and whatever they asked, were asked to sacrifice, if he went with the family to do that and to sacrifice... The right way to have approached that, and I'm sure there were some who did, and they said, now, Junior, or whatever, you know, whatever the name of his son was or his children was, there's no way a lamb or a bull is going to pay for our sins. God's going to provide one day for us. And what we're doing is we're looking to him until that, until that person comes, until that, that sacrifice is made. We're looking to him to forgive us of our sins, not come away smug and arrogant and say, boy, I did my duty. I mean, how many of us have gone to church? I know I have earlier before I was a believer. I've gone to church thinking I somehow did God a favor by going that day, you know, or that, you know, I, you leave smug and self-satisfied. And it just really points to the, the deceitfulness of sin, which is what he gets into here. So in, in um, get back over to the passage here. So in chat in, in verse, I think it's going to be in nine and ten. He's going to say this. He says, uh, "So he says, I once was alive apart from the law, but then the commandment came, and sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved me to be death." For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, it killed me. So when he says the very commandment that promised life, the commandment was given to show what was required if we were to have eternal life. 
It, it was, this is what the men, this is what you have to do. It, it reflects perfectly the character of God. And that's why the commandment was given to us. And so he said, uh, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. And so uh, how is it then that, that sin deceives? Well, first of all, we use it wrongly. Um, that is that we, we come away self-satisfied, like I've already mentioned. Paul thought that he had it going on. Um, and, and other Pharisees of their day did. And, and that's why, that's why Jesus said, you know, around the passage of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you say, but the Word of God, but I say the Word of God says this. And that is that we turn things into, we talked a little bit in Sunday school about how, how difficult it is maybe to, to uh, Mary Jane alluded to a friend of hers who she believes is probably a believer, but as a Catholic, she believes tradition is just as important as Scripture. And and um, unfortunately, that's not true. That's what they they fought against at the Reformation, but but not in the time or the place to confront them about that, probably. But anyway, and and uh, so so um, it it is it is that we we tend to use it um, wrongly. Um, first of all. Some of the ways that sin deceives us is it, it might make me think God's against me. That's how Satan tempted Eve. Has God actually said? Oh, he's just trying to keep something from you. He just knows that your eyes will be open. You surely will not die. So that's the nature of sin. It, it deceives us. Um, the law is, is unreasonable in its demands. We might think that for some reason uh, that the law is unreasonable. Um, and it... it uh, uh, also, what the, what it does is it deceives, is it praises the sinner and makes them think high of themselves. Well, we see that in Paul's life. We've probably seen it in our own lives, too, that we generally can be patting ourselves on the back. and Or it deceives us about sin itself. Um, you know, Scripture says sin is, is fun for a while, it, you know. But, but the reality is that we don't think sin is sin. We, we tend to think that it's it's something that, you know, uh, you think about Cor- uh, the Corinthians, when Paul had to speak to a church about the fact that they're tolerating sin in their church that was, wasn't even going out on the world, that a, that a man had, you know, in, in the, with the lost, that a man had his, his uh, father's wife, and he had to confront them because they probably thought, well, we're big, you know, we, we'll be more loving and we, we'll understand, he'll get over it. Whatever, whatever they're saying was wrong. So that's that's the deceptive nature of sin. Um, so anyway, so so again, the purpose of the law is to expose sin. The problem is not with the law. The problem is what sin, what sin does when it's confronted by the law. So it says here in in verse uh, in verse twelve, he concludes with this. He says, "So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good." Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So Paul concludes just by pointing out and vindicating the law, saying there's nothing wrong with the law as long as it's used correctly. And that's what we need to remember. If we think somehow that by keeping the law, that's going to approve me before God by being a good moral person, we can't do it. We can't do it perfectly. And um, and that actually it is sin is the problem in this case and not and not the law. Uh, using it correctly is, is one way we want to see that it, it should cause us in our own lives when we're confronted with sin, when we when we uh, when we see the corruption that's within because the law exposes that It should cause us to cry out to Christ and to look only to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You and we praise You that You have given us the law. I know I've been guilty of, maybe some of us have been guilty of misusing the law. Our tendency is to want to do that and to not see it as holy and just to to, um, be very stingy in our approach as far as giving all of our heart to You and realizing that it's only in the Spirit that we can please You. And it's, and it's your spirit that you've given to us, Father, that we, uh, that we seek and that we, we, uh, we pray for and we pray will cause us, um, as we're confronted with the law and our own sin, 
to uh, to reach to to fall upon Christ, to be to be totally committed to who He is, to be so thankful and and, and enamored with Christ uh, that we will allow the law to function as it is meant to function. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.